I need some help right now. I need someone who has been in the presence and the glory of God. Oh, come on, y'all can do better than that. You're not clapping for me. You're clapping for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Alpha, the Omega. Come on, push past the flesh. Begin to praise him. Come on, begin to glorify his name. The Word of God says that he inhabits the praises of his people. See, when you're making noise and you're praising the Lord, God is showing up. How many want God to show up here today? How many came here expecting something from God? How many came anticipating a move of the Holy Spirit? How many came here today knowing, knowing that God is going to do it? Come on, somebody. It's not will he do it. He is going to do it. If you believe that, put your hands together one more time and make some noise in the house of God. Hallelujah. It's 2023. Come on, it's a new chapter, a new season, a new beginning, a new opportunity. Come on, put your hands together and praise God for a new year. Oh my gosh. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 13. We're talking about having an exceptional 2023. Exceptional. You know what that means? God's going to make you an exception to the rules. See, the world flows a certain way. And that's what everybody expects. He says, you know what? You, I'm going to make you an exception. So while everybody else is going through one thing, you're going through something else. He's going to pull you out of the world and say, this, I'm going to make you an exception so that the world sees that I can do what I want to do in your life when you surrender to me. So Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3 says this. While they, everybody say they. they. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And sent them off. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, you are faithful and you speak to us every chance that we open our hearts. So right now we open our hearts. We make ourselves available. We give our minds over to you right now. We're going to focus in for the next 30 minutes, Father God, on your word and allow you to speak to us personally. Even in the midst of a group like this, you can take each of us individually and drop a word in our hearts. So we just thank you for your rhema word that will change our lives this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody would say amen. amen. Well, you know, a new year always invites a New Year's resolution. Come on, somebody. Anybody in this house do have a New Year's resolution? Nobody ever admits to that. Come on, somebody. Nobody ever wants to commit to a resolution nowadays, even, even if you've made one, because they're not always so easy to keep. Come on. Did you know the biggest, the biggest growth in a gymnasium, a gym uh, uh, in, in the city, you know, if you, if you go to ACAC or, or Planet Fitness, or any, the biggest growth, a spike that happens in those gyms is January. Everybody, come on, somebody. Because the first thing people say is, hey, I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to join the gym. And then you make those payments, come on, every single month. And four months later, you're going, wait a minute, I, I should go to that gym, shouldn't I? Or maybe, actually, the, the, pot, the growth of the gym, the first month, they have an explosion of people. Like, like if you ever go to the gym on, in January, you can't find a machine. Like, everybody's running, everybody's lifting, everybody's doing everything. But come February, come on, somebody, it is a ghost town. It's back to normal again, right? That happens because sometimes resolutions are not so easy to keep. But how many know that we can have, instead of a New Year's resolution, we can have a New Year's revolution? Oh, come on, somebody. A revolution is when, when something is overthrown. See, when you see a government, a revolution, you see that a government is overthrown and there's a revolution. We should know about that, right? Because we had a, a huge revolution back in the day, right? During the war. And we, we the, the American Revolution, where we overtook this nation from the British. And one of the reasons is freedom of religion. Come on, somebody. People forget about that, this, that what we have right now was fought many, many years ago as well in other wars. But it was one of them was freedom of religion. We didn't want to submit to, the, to the, 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 the church of England, right? And, of course, all the taxes. Mm, come on. And there was a revolution. I think we need a revolution about right now. Come on, somebody. <laughs> 
But at the end of the day, as you start seeing, what you see that, you start seeing that revolutions are about overtaking. So resolutions are, are difficult. But if you want 2023 to be exceptional, then you have to be intentional. So turn to your neighbor next to you and say, you got to be intentional. Turn to the one on the other side and say, so do I. See, our future is determined by what we consistently do daily. See, your future determined, is determined by what the habits that you do every single day. See, I was looking through the internet to find some, some resolutions just to see, and I found some funny ones, and I call these the seven ups. Everybody say seven up. Now, if you drink Pepsi, you may not like this one, but it's seven ups, and there's seven ups. Okay, here we go. The first one is this. If you're taking notes, write these in. Wake up. How many of that's important? To wake up. See, not just to wake up, but begin the day with the Lord. See, it's his day. The Bible says, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. So wake up. I always say, if God's really first in your life, he should be first in your day. Can I hear an amen? amen. The second thing is this. Dress up. <laughs> Put on a smile. <laughs> it improves how you look. Turn to your neighbor. Neighbor, you look better when you smile. Turn to your other neighbor. Say, neighbor, I don't know if a smile is going to help. No, just kidding. <laughs> smile. It says something about our attitudes. The third one is this. Come on. Shut up. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I think he's talking, about, he's talking to all of us right now. Watch your tongue. Come on, somebody. Watch our tongue. Don't gossip. Say nice things. Learn to listen more and say less. The fourth one is this. Stand up. Stand up. Take a stand for what we believe. When people are sharing all their stuff, don't shrink back at work. Be step up and say, you know what? Y'all might believe all that but I'm a Christian, come on somebody, and I believe this. And you know what? People said that the gospel is an offense to many that don't believe, but we're, we're trying to be so politically correct. Can I just tell you something? I am tired of being politically correct. I'm ready to stand. If you want to stand up for your sin, I can stand up for my righteousness. What I believe is just as valid as what you believe. And you know what? I'm cool with what you believe. If that's what you want to believe, but don't impose what you believe on me. And then don't tell me that what I believe is irrelevant. Oh, come on. Okay, let me not go there. I get fired up. So we just said, number five, look up. Look up. Open our eyes to the Lord. Start to look up. Open our eyes to the Lord. He's the only Savior that we have. Number six, reach up. Spend time in prayer with our worship, our confessions, repentance, thanksgiving, and petitions to the Lord. How many know it's okay to repent every day? Not just Sunday when you come to church. How many know we can wake up every morning and say, Father, forgive me for what I'm about to do? Come on, somebody. <laughs> And then at the end of the day, you say, Lord, I ask you for forgiveness. Forgive me for what I did. And then keep moving. How many of you, that's a good way to live? Because you never know when Jesus is showing up. That's what I look at. I go, Lord, because when I hear about something crazy, I'm, how many, when, when you're on the plane, anybody get on the plane and we would fly every once in a while? How many know that that's a great time to repent right there? <laughs> every time I get on the plane, I'm like, okay, Father God, in Jesus' name, forgive me of all my sins. Cleanse me. Because I, I'm just like... Protect that pilot. Come on, somebody. Give him understanding. I want to make sure if something happens, I'm good. Come on. I'm getting in. I'm not carrying no sin in there with me. And the last one is this. Lift up. Spend time in prayer. I'm sorry. Be available to serve, support, and share with those in need. In other words, take time to lift somebody up and to be a blessing to somebody else. Now, those seven ups look pretty cool. As a matter of fact, Rose and I were talking about making that a t-shirt. 2023, the seven ups. And I believe, how many would buy that t-shirt? Anybody? 
One, two, three. Okay, I got, we got orders already. Okay, just leave your name. We'll get the orders pre-ordered right now. But at the end of the day, I believe that's powerful, you know, to have a, a resolution. But I believe that uh, those goals, even though they're worthy, I believe the ability to apply them, and not just to apply them, but to sustain them, is found in a word used that defines all of us if you consider yourself a Christian. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you consider yourself a Christian? If you do, just raise your hand. So, what, so those that didn't raise your hand, what do you consider yourself? I'm just kidding. At the end of the day, we consider ourselves Christians. And if this is the case, then this is a word that was actually used before the word Christian. Did you know the word Christian was actually activated, was used in Acts chapter 11? Prior to Acts chapter 11, the, nobody was called Christians. They were called the people of the way. People of the way. That's how they say, oh, these people, they're, they're crazy. They're of, they're of the way. Because how many know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? Come on, somebody. So they're following his way. But because in Acts chapter 11, the people want to ridicule and mock the church. Oh, they're just Christians. Oh, you know how those people are. Yeah, they're just Christians. How many know that, we, that sounds a lot like what happens today? Oh, they're just Christians. They're closed-minded. They have, I mean, they did their heart on people, all this stuff. At the end of the day, it was Acts chapter 11. But then after that, we said, well, hey, you know what? Christian is not something that mocks up Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. So Christian means little Christ. So we're all part of that. We're parts of Christ. We're little Christ, right? So it's so powerful. But before the word Christian was used, before the way was used, they were called what? disciples oh come on somebody here we go the word disciple finds its root in the word discipline everybody say it's discipline now in the video we saw he got to discipline he says hey i'm not sure about that one but see if you want to be a follower of jesus that means we have to be disciples of jesus which means we have to be disciplined such an important part of what we do every single day as christians See, I believe that that is so powerful. And, and, you know, one of my favorite movies of all time. And when I see this movie show up, I'm like, oh, I got to watch it. I've seen it a hundred times. It's the movie Rocky. Come on. Does anybody like Rocky? Yo, Adrian. Yeah. I'm going to go in there, right? Every, Rocky, everyone, I mean, Rocky was, was an, an amazing movie, right? Even the music, you heard it every time there's a big rally. Come on, somebody. Come on. Anybody know this? Here we go. Da, da, da. Come on, come on, let's join it, come on. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Oh, come on, man, let's get the Lord ahead. Uh, Y'all know it. Now, all the young people are going, what in the world are they doing? <laughs> that movie came out in 1976, one of the biggest box office smashes. It cost about a million dollars to make, and it grossed $225 million. Not only did Rocky win, but Sylvester Stallone won too. Come on, somebody. It put him on the map. After that, man, now we got Rocky. One, two, three, four, five, six. I think they're to eight right now, right? Creed one, Creed two, Creed five. I mean, I, I believe they're going to make it. Now, finally, you know, Rocky's going to die eventually, right? Uh, the, that's going to be Rocky 10, and then somebody, his son takes over. It's just going to keep on and on. It's, it's like the movie that never ends. Come on, somebody. More sequels than anything else you've ever heard. But they're always amazing. And why does a movie like Rocky capture all of our imagination? Not only is it inspiring, but it, put, it, it showed us what the power of a dream. Everybody say dream. When you have a dream and you back it with determination and discipline, you see what happened in that movie. Everybody's cheering for the underdog. Come on, somebody. Everybody wants Rocky to win. And I tell you, one of the most impressive scenes that I love about that movie, and every time I see it, I think, man, is when he's exercising, when he's training in the gym, doing all that. <clears throat> but when he starts doing one arm push ups, oh, come on, how many know what I'm talking about? When he puts his hand behind his back, after that, after that movie, we all try to do it. Come on, somebody. 
all of y'all around here, you know, you try. We all said, you know, let's just do this. We're like, uh, that was fake. Come on, he didn't do that for real. He had wires pulling him up and down. Every time he went up and down, you just couldn't see them. No, I'm just kidding. He actually did it. But we all try to do it. We're like, that was so powerful, the strength, the sit-ups, right? And then every single morning at the crack of dawn, before the sun came out, he put his jogging suit on. Come on. And he was running through the streets of Philadelphia. Rain, snow, cold. Were you anybody from Philly here? Okay, we're sorry to hear that. No, but just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> And, and you know, on the la I, I had a trip to Philly not too long ago, about a couple years back, and I had to see the I had to see the statue. Come on, somebody! I mean, you know, you've made a movie that's impacted the world when they put your statue right in front of the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Come on, and you see that scene when he's running up them steps. Come on, somebody! I ran up them steps, yo, but but I was out of breath for real when I got to the top. I, I might have stopped halfway. I don't even I can't remember. I was, I, was, I was short of oxygen right there at the top. But, when I, but I stood right next to the statue, and I lifted up my hands. I said, praise you, Jesus, because I'm a champion, too. Do we have any champions in the house here today? Come on. If you're a champion, come on. Put your hands together. Praise the Lord. I declare that you are a champion. And I did that, and I thought that was the coolest thing ever. But that movie was so powerful. His daily regiment. And the required discipline and consistency that he had to pull off for that, that conditioned his mind, it conditioned his heart, so that when he got in the ring, he could win. Oh, some of y'all are going to get this in a moment. See, at the end of the day, what we're doing in this building right now is we're just conditioning. Come on, somebody. We're just practicing. We're just training. Because the battle starts every time we walk out the doors. Come on, somebody. When you go to work, that's the ring. When you talk to people around you, that's the ring. See, you condition yourself because you want to be prepared. We say prepared. Yeah. So when the battle starts, you're ready. Now, the good thing about Rocky and those, those boxing matches, they, they're scheduled. They say, on this day, this time, this place, there's going to be a battle. But how many of you know a lot of times the battles that we fight are not scheduled. They just show up. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm in the middle of a battle right now. What are you talking about? They just show up. They, you don't plan those battles. The enemy shows up. Uh, somebody opposes you. Something happens, and they just show up uninvited, unwanted, and they just show up. So you see, that daily routine prepares you for when those things do show up because at the end of the day, what you do daily accumulates. What you do randomly dissipates. It's like going to the gym once a month. Come on, somebody. A lot of folks go to the gym once a month and look in the mirror and go, man, I can't wait. And all of a sudden, how many of you go to the gym once a month, the next day your sore is all get out? Because you're pushing yourself hard. Come on, some of y'all laughing. You know what I'm talking about. You go in there, I'm going to do good this year. And you start and you overwork out. And next thing you know, you're in pain. You can't even walk. You did too many leg presses. You did too many of this. And you're walking around in pain. If you don't continue to go, that pain will continue to be there. How many of you have to push past the pain? So when you go, give yourself one day to recover, go back the next day, even though you're still sore, and you do it again. And then you keep doing that over and over. Eventually, you won't be in pain every, after every workout, but you'll start seeing the results of what you're doing because you're doing it consistently, and consistent action creates consistent results. So we have to do it on a regular basis. So in God's word, they were disciples before they were called Christians because their spiritual effectiveness really was required, required a disciplined life that was being modeled by Christ himself. See, the beauty of disciples were they were not just being taught. They were also things that they were caught. See, they weren't just being taught in the book. They were being taken out to the streets and learning by an example. Jesus modeled everything he talked about. So the disciples, imagine three years being taught by Jesus and then seeing his teaching and his word come to life. And then I could imagine at night, come on, in the evening when they all got together, say, man, that was a great day, Jesus. Wow, that feed, that, you fed the 5,000? Man, we got leftovers. Come on, somebody. We still got the left. We got 12 baskets left over, all this fish. How about we just take that for later? Can I get a doggy bag, somebody? Take it with me. 
At the end of the day, imagine what those conversations were like every day when they got home and said, man, that that was awesome. When that blind, that guy was blind all his life and and you came, I mean, it must have been amazing conversations after every day. But see, that's what he did. He taught them for three years and he not just taught them with words, but he did it, he did it also with his actions as I slowly, my actions knock my thing off here. Anyway, um, so, so, so he showed us that having a disciplined life is really part of being a disciple. See, self-discipline is the ability to do what you should do when you should do it, no matter how you think or how you feel. How many of our biggest enemy are our emotions? I mean, our emotions, uh, listen, there, there's people that I know, I know you're not here right now. I'm talking about the folks that are not here right now. That's why I'm going to talk about them. There are people that look outside the window on a Sunday morning and go, oh my gosh, it's raining. I'm not coming to church. Oh my God. Oh, did, did one sixteenth of an inch of snow fall down? Oh my gosh. Is there flurries? Oh, not only am I not going to church, I'm going straight to food line. Come on, somebody. I, I, think, I think grocery stores pray for snow because they empty out the bread section, the milk section, the egg section. How many know what I'm talking about? I mean, a dusting, just one little thing of snow. They call them fair weather people. They're always looking for fair weather. I don't know about you. Listen, (laughs) because our church, so many of us are from different parts of the world, different parts of the country. I mean, I'm from Chicago. So unless 12 inches fall in an hour, I'm coming to church. Come on, somebody. If I can drive through it, I'm going to make it to it. Come on. Now, at the end of the day, some people are like, oh, my God, this world's going to end. We're going to just start packing everything in. And I'm like, you know what? It's because eventually somewhere along the line, I don't know about you, I love coming to church. Come on. Before I was a pastor, when I first came to Jesus, listen, I didn't just come Sunday, by the way. Back then was Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday as well. Because I just, and then Friday night prayer, Thursday night practice, Monday night Bible college. I mean, I, I got so caught up. I loved the house of God. And I loved Christ. And I loved what's happening in my life, the change. And I don't know about you, I don't come to church as an option. Church has never been an option for me. Church is mandatory. For me. I can only say for me. Because I knew where I came from. And if I want to go back to where I came from, I had to make sure that this new man kept getting fed. Come on, somebody. How many know that the new man will always try to resurrect? So we got to keep him undercover. So we got to keep him down. And you do that by feeding your, by feeding your spirit more than you feed your flesh. See, if, it's good to persist. If you're persistent, you can get it. But if you're disciplined, you get to keep it. See, imagine God giving you all this territory because you're being persistent. But if you're not disciplined, you'll just have to fall back again because you won't be able to maintain it and keep it as well. And unfortunately, there are two things that stand in our way. Number one is this, distractions. Distractions will get in our way for sure. Matthew 13, 22 says, for for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. Distractions. Don't allow the worries and the cares of this world to choke you out and rob you of God's timing for you. The second thing is this, deception. Matthew chapter 7, uh, 5 and 16 says this. This is Jesus speaking. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. At the end of the day, how many of we have to be careful to what we listen to? Oh, come on, somebody. I've heard things from people, I'm telling you what, people who've been on television for 30 years and came out with some crazy stuff. And I'm like, whoa, 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 that's not biblical. Because how many know the best way to not be deceived is to know the truth? And not just know the truth, but stay in the truth. Because the Bible says in the, in the last days that even the elect can be deceived. You know who the elect are? Look to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I think that's us. Absolutely. So we got to stay sharp in God's word. But see, one of the most powerful yet often ignored disciplines in our spiritual lives is the practice of fasting. Why is fasting so hard? Because we like to eat. Come on, somebody. 
Is there anybody here that doesn't like to eat? Anybody, just really doesn't like to eat at all. I can tell there's nobody going to raise their hand on that one. Especially after the holiday season. Come on, somebody. That's why we're all trying to get to the gym. <laughs> because of all the stuff we ate over the holidays. See, fasting is mentioned over 80 times in the Old Testament, over 50 times in the New Testament. See, fasting is simply a spiritual discipline of depriving oneself of the pleasure of food to focus on God. See, it's also this. It's a voluntary hardship. Listen to this. It's a voluntary hardship. How many know sometimes the way to become harder is to put yourself in a hard place and overcoming something? So we voluntarily deprive ourselves, which is hard to do, but it makes you tougher-minded. Come on, somebody. When all of a sudden I can say, you know what? I can push that, that Mickey D sandwich away. Come on. I don't, I'm not going to cook out today. I want to push that to the side because your body says, feed me, feed me. And your mind says, in the name of Jesus, I'm going to take this time that I would be eating. I'm going to spend it with God because I'm more hungry for God than I am for food. But how many know that's a discipline that you have to get to sometimes? I mean, it depends how bad you want something from God, right? It helps build endurance so that when real adversity shows up, you've been training. Come on. See, Rocky had, Rocky's training was, was actually, in, was voluntary hardship. Pushing yourself harder and harder. So when the time of the battle shows up, you're hard enough, come on somebody, to come out on top. See, so important. You see, Rosa mentioned this earlier as well. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus is there and his disciples are trying to cast a demon out of this young boy. They think that he's epileptic. That's what the Bible says. But the Bible says that, that the man said, man, your, your, your guys aren't doing it. Jesus, you got to do something about this. Jesus steps up and says, you prefer, you're perverse and faithless generation, talking to his guys. And then he talks to the, the, the demon, says, demon, come out. And the demon comes out immediately. The, guy, the, the disciples turn to him and say, Jesus, wait a minute. We've been working hard at this. I mean, we've been here for hours. We, as a matter of fact, all 12 of us took turns. Doubting Thomas wasn't doing too good. I'll just tell you that right now. But the rest of we were all digging in, and nothing happened. And all of a sudden, you just step in, and in one split second, the enemy leaves, the devil's gone. He says, yeah. He goes, because praying is good. And you learn how to pray because you're learning from me. But let me tell you what, some of the things that we have to deal with will only come out with prayer and fasting. God, Jesus just revealed the most powerful secret, the most, big, the, the most powerful weapon that you and I have against the enemy, and that is fasting. Because when you start to fast and pray, it puts your prayer life in turbo. Everybody say turbo charge. It turbocharges what you can do in the spirit realm, and the authority and the power are released. There are five major benefits to fasting, and we're going to just get ready to fill in the blanks quickly. There are five, and not just fasting, but corporate fasting, because the Bible talks about individuals fasting, but he also talks about corporate fasting. When, when people got together, a whole nation gets together to pray, when a church gets together to pray, and the first one is this, if you're filling in the blanks. Incre it increases our unity. Corporate fasting increases our unity. Acts chapter 13 verse 2 says this, while they were. See, much like the, the book of Acts chapter 2, the Bible says they were all in one accord. They were all upstairs. They were praying, believing God in one accord, that unity. See, they heard from God as a unified group. It wasn't an individual who heard what the Holy Spirit said. It was all of them. So that fasting and, and, and praying got the whole church on the same page. See when, fast, see, when we're fasting, we're physically denying our flesh, and our egos and self-centeredness have no place. See, we begin to starve the flesh while feeding the spirit. Come on, somebody. You starve your flesh so that the spirit person inside of you can get stronger. Amen? So you can walk in the spirit. The Bible says when you walk in the spirit, you, will not, you can overcome. Come on. You can overcome the flesh. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. So important for us to understand that because we're only as strong as we are united. We're only as weak as we are divided. 
So by fasting together as a corporate group, it's going to create a unity within us right here that's going to be so powerful. I'm believing that when people walk through that door, come on somebody, first of all, they're going to be driving by the church and have no idea why they turned in. Oh, come on. They're, they're gonna, then when they get in and say, well, they're going to feel like, well, I, don't, I don't really don't want to be here, but I feel like I need to be here. And they're going to walk in that door. Some folks are going to be so deep in their sin. Some folks are going to be suicidal. Some folks are going to be hurting. And God's going to pull them off the street because this church is fasting and praying. And the Holy Spirit is going to start moving supernaturally in people's lives around us. They're going to get saved. They're going to heal. They're going to become leaders. They're going to become pastors, evangelists, prophets. Come on, somebody. At the end of the day. Oh, come on. Somebody else has to believe that besides me. The second thing is this. When we, we, when, we, when we corporately fast, it enhances our sensitivity to the Spirit. In Acts chapter 13, it continues and says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. They were worshiping and fasting. See, notice that uh, the believers in Antioch, fasting was related to worship. Everybody say worship. Worship. See, the two go hand in hand. Why? Because when we fast, we form a supernatural sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. When you begin to fast and pray, you're going to sense something on the inside of you. You're going to be able to hear God a little clearer. See, the corporate fast led to a corporate sensitivity to, then a response from the Holy Spirit. See, we need to train our minds to hear what God whispers so that we can hear, so we can't hear what the enemy and the world is shouting. The world's voice is loud. How many can say amen? You turn the news on, you hear this, you hear that. It's loud. Sometimes the Holy Spirit is trying to talk, but there's too much noise. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there's too much noise. When you start fasting, God's going to tune you in to the Holy Spirit's voice. See, right now, all over this house, while you're sitting there right now, just lift up your hands for a moment. I just want you to pray this. Just close your eyes and pray this after me. Holy Spirit, move in my life, move in my heart, move in my family, move in my dreams. I want you to have all of me and use me to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a praise. The third thing is this. It uncovers our potential. Corporate fasting uncovers our potential. In Acts chapter 13, verse 2, and continues and says this. The Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So what did the Spirit say to the believers in Acts chapter 13? That he had set apart two of them for the work that he had called them to do. You see, Saul and Barnabas found their deepest God-given abilities, their ministry direction, and they stepped out to fulfill the potential that they had at that point. You know, it's, it's amazing when you read that story in, in Antioch, uh, in, in, in that chapter, uh, uh, Barnabas and Saul had been traveling, and they, all of a sudden they got to Antioch, and God sat them down. God took them off the road. These were the traveling evangelists going from town to town. All of a sudden, they got to Antioch, when you read the Bible, and God said, eh, you need to park right here for a little while. And they parked themselves there. They began to teach. They became part of the active body. They became part of the church there in Antioch. But I have a feeling on the inside, they're like, you know, okay, God has a season for us to actually participate in the church. But on the inside, they're evangelists. On the inside, they know they've been called to reach the world. But how many know that God's timing is always perfect? I believe that God took them in those two years in Antioch and prepared them. Because when you read after chapter 11 and 13, and when they leave Antioch, the opposition is even harder. Come on, somebody. God took them, parked them, charged them up, and then sent them out at the right time. And now they're able to continue to preach the word. So powerful and so amazing. How many of those God's timing is always right? See, it's like in 1 Samuel 16. When Samuel, when God told Samuel, go find the next king. See, when you read that, you start, and then you read about the, the brothers of David all showing up first. How many know when it's your calling, it doesn't matter who shows up first? You could be the eighth one on the list. That's what happened to David. He was the eighth one. And the eighth person received the calling of kingship. 
But you see, it's so powerful because the Bible says that when Samuel had saw the seven first and said, not this one, the Holy Spirit said, not this one, not this one. When he saw that little scrawny kid, come on somebody, coming from the sheep, smelling like sheep, come on now. How many know pastors need to smell like sheep? Shepherds need to smell like sheep. Guess what he did? When he got pulled in, the Bible says, this is the one. Come on, somebody. The Holy Spirit said, this is the one. And that moment, David was activated. His kingship on the inside, something was called out and said, you're going to be the next king. How many know that's going to do something inside of you? <laughs> Woo, wait, wait a minute. I'm just out there with the sheep. He says, you know, you know what? The way you can handle sheep, you can handle my people. Oh, my God. Somebody's going to get this. See, you might be just handling sheep right now. You might be looking at what you're doing as a mundane, monotonous thing. I believe God's going to call you out in 2023 and say, come on, step out. There's something going to be activated inside of you that you don't even know right now. Listen, if you do what God has called you to do in 2023, at the end of this year, you're going to have to reintroduce yourself to who the new you is. You won't even recognize what God's going to do this year. I believe that with all my heart. If you give God 2023, if you come to church on a regular basis, if you join a prayer group, if you submerse yourself in God, I guarantee you at the end of this year, you'll look in the mirror and go, wow, that's not even the same person that started out this journey. Can I hear an amen? Oh, come on, put your hands together if you don't believe it. And if you don't believe it, that's okay, clap anyway, praise God. You know, I, I love tea. Anybody else a tea drinker around here, anybody? No, I like coffee once in a while, but I love tea. But how many know that if you take a tea bag... You submerge it just one time. Doesn't do a whole lot, does it? I guess it wet the tea bags, but it didn't do a whole lot for the water. Maybe if you do it once or twice more, maybe just a, oh, a little bit happen. But if you leave it in there and let it submerge itself, you'll start seeing the color of the water begin to change because what's in the tea bag begins to release itself inside the water. Now the water begins to taste like tea. See, you'll begin to taste what you submerge yourself in. Oh, come on, somebody. Y'all going to get this in a minute. See, some folks just dip themselves in the Lord. Oh, you know, every once in a while. Oh, it's Easter. I better go to church. Oh, Christmas. I better go to church. And then they wonder why nothing ever changes. But when you come Sunday, come on, somebody. When you start coming on Wednesday, when you start serving in the church, when you stop being an attender, you become a contributor. When all of a sudden you start walking in your calling, all of a sudden you start getting up in the morning and praying and reading your Bible. You begin to immerse yourself in what God has for your life. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to change. <laughs> You're going to grow. You'll turn into what you submerse yourself in. And guess what that means? That means you'll be more like God. You'll walk in peace, in righteousness. Oh, you'll have, maybe maybe your, your anger will subdue. Come on, somebody. Maybe your wisdom will get better. Maybe you'll be tuned in. Maybe you'll look at your friends and go, eh, I think I need some new friends. Come on, somebody. Maybe I need some folks that are going to speak something positive in my life. You'll look around and start saying, something's got to change. Why? Because you've submerged yourself so much in God. You're starting to look like God. Come on, somebody. Can you give the Lord a praise just for a moment? I know some of y'all won't remember the sermon, but you might remember that tea bag. <laughs> See, he uncovers all our potential. The fourth thing is this. Corporate fasting prioritizes prayer. It prioritizes prayer. Acts chapter 13, verses 3, the first part says, after they had fasted and prayed. If you notice the beginning, it said they were worshiping and fasting. But they were doing so good, they just said, hey, you know what? After hearing from God, they began to, they took an additional time now to fast and pray. See, prayer is the partner of fasting. Prayer is the partner of fasting. See, because you can pray without fasting, but you shouldn't fast without praying. Come on. Oh, come on. And at the end of the day, listen, prayer can happen every morning. I want to encourage you, if you don't have a time of prayer, how many have Facebook? Anybody? 
Sometimes we have to spend less time. Some folks are going are, are to have to probably uh, uh, fast their social media. Come on, somebody. Because you get so caught up in social media, man. I don't know about you. The, the people see me posting. I'm like, that's all I do. Like, I don't spend time flipping. I just try to stay with. How many of that can suck you right in? Once you start flipping through Instagram, all of a sudden, oh, 15 minutes just went by. Oh, this and I'm, oh, I like this. Oh, I don't like that. You know what? At the end of the day, social media is powerful. If at 7 o'clock in the morning, you tune into New Life Outreach International Social Media on Facebook Live, and you participate with Walking in the Spirit program, where we gather together and do a Bible study every single morning, and we pray every single morning, Monday through Friday, and joining corporate fasting. Come on, somebody. Or, if you don't feel like doing that, every Tuesday night, 7 p.m., come on, somebody. Right here, Pastor Martin has a group that gathers corporate prayer right here in the sanctuary every single week. And we join together to pray. Let's see. See, the Bible says that when two or more, when two or three or more gather, he shows up. When two or three or more agree, touch and agree that he does stuff. So corporate, corporate prayer is important. How many of the God didn't design us to be lone rangers? Come on, somebody. Oh, there's a lot of lone ranger Christians. I don't need anybody. It's just me and Jesus. Just me and my Bible. Pray the Lord. Glory to God. It's only the King James, by the way. Thank you. All the other ones don't really matter. At the end of the day, God never designed us to be on our own. The Bible says, don't forsake the gathering of the brethren together. That's not just talking about church. It's talking about constant fellowship with one another because the Bible says that when the days get worse, when the end gets closer, it's going to get challenging. And if you're standing by yourself, who's going to pray for you? Who are you going to turn to? Who's the person that's going to bring food to you when your pantry is, uh, is empty? Who's going to be around you to encourage you when you need encouragement? See, we need each other, and it prioritizes prayer, and gathering together is, is so powerful. You know, I spoke to Lauren, one of our, our, our girls from the, she actually uh, is part of the Grow team, and I talked to her yesterday, and she said, and I said, and I was just talking about Grow, and she says, you know, Pastor, I want to thank you for those morning sessions. I said, really? She goes, I, have, I don't miss any of them. I need them. I said, really? Tell me, tell me how it's affected you. The first thing she says is this, I learned how to pray. Could it be that our prayers are not effective because we're not praying correctly? Does God have a system for prayer? He sure does. And if you learn how to pray that way, then a 15, minute, a 15 minutes won't even be enough after a while because you have a system to pray. She said, not only did I learn how to pray, I learned how to pray so well that I began to pray for a job and two jobs came open, two offerings. So then I began to pray, well, which one do I take, Lord? And, she, and then, and then uh, she, she said, well, which one do you want? She said, well, I want this one, but this one's already offering me some money already. So are you going to settle for what you've got, or are you going to settle for what you want? See, so many people complain about their jobs. Man, you know what? Gosh, I can't come to church because of my job. I, I work with all these people. I work all these hours. Can I tell you? That you can change a job? Is that okay? Can I just tell you that your resume can go out to people and people can actually hire you? Do you know you could pray and say, you know what, I want a job that's nine to five so I don't have to work on the weekends? How many of that God can actually answer that prayer? You know why? Because that's what happened with her and many other people on this program. I said, man, I was working all these crazy hours. I said, well, why don't you just pray that God will give you the exact same things? And you know what? The scripture came in mind. You receive not because you ask not. So why do we settle for what we have and not ask God for what we want? Is God able? The Bible says he's able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we can ever ask, think, or imagine. So if we ask God, he is able to do it. He is able to do more than we could ever imagine. And I want to close with this. The last thing it does is it broadens our reach. Corporate, corporate fasting broadens our reach. In Acts chapter 13, it says, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. See, finally Saul and Barnabas were commissioned to continue working the work of telling others about Jesus. 
See, I'm sure the two of them were probably content for that moment while they were in Antioch because the Bible says that Jesus said, reach those in Jerusalem, Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. And Antioch was kind of a distance from where the Jerusalem was. So they could have said, well, we are reaching the ends of the earth. But they weren't satisfied yet because there was something on the inside that said, we got to keep going. And the Holy Spirit spoke and launched them. See, but fasting led Saul and Barnabas to see new avenues and ministry, new people who need to hear the message. They continued on after that because God spoke to their hearts and activated them. See, some of us need to be activated. See, there's something on the inside that you want, and the Holy Spirit's going to activate it in your life this year. You see, the apostles fasted to break bondages. Ezra fasted to solve problems. Samuel fasted for evangelism and revival. Elijah fasted to break discouragement. The widow fasted for humanitarian needs. Daniel fasted for health and healing. John the Baptist fasted for character and influence. Esther fasted for spiritual warfare. Jesus fasted to start his ministry. At the end of the day, it's all over the Bible. What is your need? Fast and pray, and we're all going to believe including myself that God is going to do exceptional this year in your life and right now you can set the tone if you believe that put your hands together give the Lord a praise imagine what happens when your potential is unlocked what happens when we all get together in unity what's it going to look like to your family when they begin to see the anointing of God increasing in your life what's your people at work going to say when all of a sudden you walk in the room and it shifts the atmosphere because you've been fasting and praying what's going to happen when you go to different places and start walking in and people are talking all kind of crazy stuff and the moment you walk in they get quiet and the moment they say something terrible they say oh, excuse my French because they sense the holiness of God the presence of God in your life and fasting and praying will release that and listen I'm believing that this year God's going to take us to the next level what is it that you're believing God for this year what is the one thing that if God did this for you let me ask you a question if God if I could guarantee this morning guarantee that there's one thing that will come through to your life how big could you dream? How big is your dream? If you knew it would happen, how big could you dream? You don't want to ask that question, people get quiet because they start thinking. Because you know what? A lot of our dreams have been crushed. We've wanted so many things in our lives. We, get, we go through rejection sometimes. We fail sometimes, and sometimes we just stop dreaming. You know, we, we have no vision. Helen Keller said, what's worse than a person that's blind is a person with sight and no vision. The Bible says without vision, we'll perish. So maybe God will use this moment, this opportunity of fasting and praying to relight those dreams in your heart, to give you a vision for what he wants. Because once you have a vision, now you've got a purpose. And once you have a purpose, now you can start fasting and praying with a, with a, with a destiny, with a destination in mind. And I'm believing that's what's going to happen to a lot of us in this room. I want you to dream again. Come on, anybody here ready to dream again? and dream bigger dreams and believe God for bigger things God has no limit come on somebody he's only limited to what you believe him for if you serve a small God and have small dreams God can do that if you serve a big God with big dreams God will do that too it takes the same amount of faith to get something small than it does to get something big so you might as well believe for the big things might as well, listen blow it up something ridiculous something that only God can do amen and I believe this year is going to be your year how many believe that today if you do put your hands together give the Lord a praise oh come on let's make some noise in the house of God as we stand up all over this house come on lift up your hands all over the house right now for just a moment